How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Care Talk. We have a great question coming your way. This question was given to us by Connie, who's also going to be on this show. She's going to discuss the civilian perspective on this one. But we did a show recently, which was myself, Connie, and Russ. And we discussed what to do when an inmate lies to you when they get injured. And during that discussion, Connie realized that, man, there's a lot of discretion that has to be employed. How do you have someone that's new, have that developed discretion that's needed to do the job, or how can you help cultivate them to earn, learn that discretion, if you will. So I'm gonna provide what I feel is the safety security side of it, because I know definitely we need discretion because a lot of the situations that we deal with are really just novel and we have to adapt and adjust. And I'll explain how we develop that discretion. But also I thought Connie could touch on it from the medical side, because I'm sure they're dealing with a lot of novel situations. I mean, they're working in the prison too. They're working in the jails too. So how do they cultivate their employees? How do they try to give them, I want to say the courage to make decisions, you know, be constructive with it, but also you're dealing with life and death. So those decisions are quite emergent and any error really can't be overlooked. So when we come back from our sponsors, I'll introduce you to Connie, and then we will go ahead and discuss how we cultivate our employees, how we develop discretion. That's the key in our people that are new. So if you haven't, the show Tear Talks for you, brave men and women that work in corrections, so please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. That bell is going to notify you every time I post a video. Stand by for our sponsor. When we come back, cultivating our employees and teaching them how to develop discretion. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. Guys, inmate manipulation is a course that is highly needed. It's the process that's so slow moving and subtle that you don't realize it's happening. When inmates choose to manipulate, they manipulate our need to react. Situational awareness and insight is gonna save your career. It's gonna save you from doing foolish things. Listen to your gut. So the more insight we have, the more we can recognize what isn't so overt, and we can correct our behavior before we fall into a trap that we can't get out of. If you allow an inmate, to pull you out of your prescribed role, you are opening up a door for a host of problems. Inmate manipulation, the psychology behind inmate manipulation. Available now, link in description. And we are back. Okay, first, as promised, Con Connie, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Hi, good morning. My name is Connie Aline. I am the president and founder of the Civilian Corrections Academy. I come to you guys with 10 years of administrative experience at Rikers Island, and then another five years at Connecticut Department of Corrections. And now I'm having tons of fun as a criminal justice professor at Monroe College and enjoying all the work that I do at Anthony. So thanks for having me again. Connie, you also have two podcasts. What are the names of the podcasts? I do. I have the Fly Behind the Wall podcast that is on, it's set up on Anchor, but it's available on all your listening platforms. And I have Conversations with Connie, which actually rolls out today. Oh, I, I actually got a chance to hear uh, a little bit from Fly on the Wall, was it? I love it. The information, yeah. information gets right in there, very informative. If people are in this profession, even if you're cussing, you should listen to it because it kind of gives you an expectation of what the civilians see and uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, what I was able to listen to that night, actually. I listened to it that night when you sent me the link. Wow, thank you, thank you. Wow. I'm like, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's like growing, but you know, you just think to yourself when you're doing something from just a pure space, like I just wanted to talk about my experiences and how, you know, we experience jail and prison from 
a civilian space and then all of a sudden it just starts to grow like it's really a, a great thing well you know what's funny is that's sort of what tear talk is it's really based on shared experience and that's kind of a little bit of our topic right now because yes. it's experience that develops discretion so um wait great way to lead into it now you asked a great question guys if you get a chance please check out the last episode which is about an hour hour and change hour and a half very, very good. We talked about basically how inmates collide when they get injured and the stuff that you have to do to make sure that you've done your due diligence. And a lot of it really is based on experience. You know, some of the stuff that we do is it's not, it's not written in policy or procedure. So Connie asked a question where, you know, again, there's a lot of stuff there for a new boot to be able to, that has to be able to do, but I feel that's hard because the new boot's not going to have that experience. So how do you cultivate that new boot? How do you teach them discretion. What I mean by discretion is simply put is it's nothing defined. It's just you, you pick something up on the moment and you run with it because at that point it is, is I, there's not a policy or procedure that may tell me what to do. So how do I lean on my experience? How do I lean on my knowledge? And again, if you're new, you don't have that. And we're dealing with a lot of emergency situations, which requires us to really make decisions on the fly. And it was a phenomenal question. It really was. And when we first posed it, Russ' immediate response was great. It was, take time to make sure that your, your rookies are observing everything. Make sure that they're learning. They're passively collecting information. They're, you know, looking for what to do and what not to do, and then trying to build uh, their own foundation on the good and the bad. And eventually, I, I think a lot of the discretion comes passively. You know, we're not, we're not aware of the stuff that we take in until we realize maybe like three years later, we look back to see how much we learned or how much we grow, because growing is subtle. It's slow moving. But I would assume the same for medical, correct? I mean, you would give them the same advice, right? Observe, learn from the best and the worst. So we do try to make sure that, especially you've got like a new nurse, a new social worker, whoever it is, anyone new in service provision, we try to make sure they're partnered with someone who's been there for some time, who can kind of really share their insights in the moment, who's going to be with them to observe really how they engage with the population, observe how they engage with custody, and really like nip some things in the bud. Cause you know, some people come in thinking they know. And so when you identify that there's this false sense of confidence, like, cause that could be really dangerous. We usually try to make sure like that person is clear on sort of the, the implications of their actions. I think the other thing we do from a medical perspective is we try to gauge the experience that that medical professional had prior to coming in because there's some very different um, probably standards of care or the way we would do something in the community versus the way we would do something in prison. You know, all of the technology that you may have access to in the community may not be what you have access to in the prison. And so the way you provide treatment may vary because of that. And so we try to make sure that, you know, as a service provider, when you come in, you get the support that you need because we get it, you know, it's, it's not your normal environment and you may do some things that get you caught up and you don't realize that that's what's happening. Right. And as we dive deeper into this topic, I want to mention, that I know in custody, there are a lot of times where we have to deal with situations that aren't initially defined by policy. And I'm using the word initially because I'll explain that uh, when it comes to cultivating discretion. Medical, the same thing, correct? I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that you have to deal with that just aren't initially defined by policy. Absolutely. And then, and then something happens, and then we develop policy to make sure that this, this particular vulnerability doesn't come to bite us again. Because it doesn't make sense that you've had an experience, you identified that you have a gap in your policies, and then you don't do anything about it. That sort of leaves us in this space of liability when we leave it open to possibly happening again, even if it was a fluke on the first time that it happened. Right. And, and also in the process is you have to be, as a supervisor, you want to be constructive when people make choices, because in our profession, you want people to make choices. You want to transform them actually to be leaders themselves, which means you want to empower them to make choices. But having said that, because we deal with life and death situations, you know, sometimes there could be stress. And if the wrong choice is made, we as supervisors wind up maybe being overwhelmed ourselves and then flipping out on the employee, not realizing that 
you know, not realizing the circumstances that the employee was under when they had to make those decisions. That's why it's very important that in, in our profession, if we want people to make decisions when policy is just not there, you know, we have to make sure that when we cultivate them, that we get an understanding of why they made the choices before we ever decide to flip out or let the stress get the best of us. Because the key here is we want to cultivate them so we don't have a hesitant force. And again, when you don't, oh, go ahead, Connie. So I was just going to say, like, judgment is subjective, right? And so we do have people out in the field who are making judgment calls all the time. And as long as the root or the foundation of that judgment call was based in policy, if they've had to vary or veer away from that judgment, from the, the policy for any reason, like, usually it's because there was some some variable that they were considering in the moment. And so I think as managers we have to be very open to truly understanding the full picture that the person made that judgment call in. Here's the information they had at the time when they made that call. Right, and also as supervisors, you have to realize that your new boots are probably gonna look for strictly what's policy and procedure. We'll get a hold of that because they don't have a developed discretion yet, but they are developing it. So if by chance they, they go to implement something that, again, makes sense, at least for them at that time, like you said, I know judgment is subjective, but again, if you understand that maybe you could build an understanding of why that choice was made. If you flip out of them at that very beginning where they're vulnerable, that will set up a standard where they're not going to take the initiative and you wind up just pretty much robbing the potential of that individual for growth and probably really to be one of the best there could be. But unfortunately that initial impression of you not being constructive, you wanting to rip them apart, unfortunately tainted them for the rest of their career. Would you agree? I agree. I mean, just imagine the first day you walked into a facility, right? Like you don't walk in knowing what you're doing. You walk in like trying to figure things out. And as time progresses, you figure things out little by little, but you still know that there's some knowledge gap there. And so the fact that you would make a mistake, I mean, so just think of the individual who they're trying to do their best, right? On top of that, we've got this culture of people who've worked in facilities for many, many years. And so you come in and like, you're the newbie, right? And so what does that pressure feel like where you're trying to function, you're trying to earn the respect of your, your colleagues, you're trying to earn the respect of administration, you don't want to mess up. But then when pressure comes on, I mean, sometimes, you know, people panic, right? And so we would like to think that that is not going to happen because we shouldn't panic. But it does happen. And so I think those are those teaching moments where we can say, okay, I understand the full picture of what's going on. Let's talk about how you could have made a better decision. Like there's a way to be constructive and use that as a moment. Now, before we go into the specifics of Colton, I want to ask you one more thing, just about a supervisor, because in order for us to really get to where we got to go, I have to make sure that the supervisors don't mess with that process. So we had to put this in there, because if we're going to teach people to be to utilize discretion, I know for a fact we'll have people that will say, well, there'll be employees that are going to damn me. So just to give one last piece of advice to the employer, I meant to say employer, give one last piece of advice to the employee, the supervisor, if you will, before you damn somebody for the initiative, you have to take into account that they made an initiative. What does that mean to you, Connie? That just means that there's some people who um, will just do their job, right? Like they're going to just stick to the script. And then there are some people who will see that something else needs to happen, like, because they're trying to sort of, work within the confines of their scope, but they're also trying to help, right? So like when you know that this initiative is coming from a positive space, like there was no malice in it, like you cannot just jump and pounce on people because they took the initiative. Cause then you could have people that's like, all right, whatever, I'm not going to do nothing. Right. And like, that's the last thing you need that people you have employees who are in the moment looking at situations where they could have intervened, but they didn't because they've got a supervisor who's a crappy supervisor who's now going to jump all over them, who's discouraged them from taking the initiative. I mean, it's different if they were already informed, hey, listen, that has nothing to do with you. Someone else is handling it. That's different from 
someone has seen there's a vulnerability, they're, they're, they're taking a step to try to help avoid it becoming a bigger issue, and now they're getting chewed out for it. I like how you said positive space. I mean, that, to me, that just kind of sums up everything we're saying, knowing that you know, even though there may have been a bad outcome, because uh, it does happen, we're making decisions on the fly, where does it originate from? Does it originate from someone who was negligent or does it originate from someone that was malicious or does it originate from someone that really had good intent and just got caught up in the moment like we all do? So I, I thought that was great. Just th that, that was really good. And again, the reason why we did that is now we can explore what the topic's about. But again, we have to set the foundation because if we don't do that, we could do us all we want. But the supervisors have to realize that they're a part of this. They're not separated from it. Okay, so real quick, the question that you asked again was, you know, we're put in a lot of situations that are novel and it does require discretion to solve it. And when you have a lot of new boots, regardless, custody, civilian side, medical, you know, how do you get them to one, have the courage to make a decision? Because that's the key, especially when they may not have the information needed at that point because they don't have the experience or, or knowledge. Or how do you cultivate them to develop that discretion? So I'm going to go into a little bit first about cultivating. Right. Uh, I thought we could discuss cultivating and then we could discuss making having to make a decision with limited information, including that experience. So sometimes you have you're blessed with the luck to be able to cultivate an employee. You know, unfortunately, that's not always the case. But let's do that first. Uh, we, we live in tough times where we're very understaffed. We're losing experienced employees because the incentives aren't there. So you get a lot of employees that are new to the job that don't have a foundation that are put in situations that they have to make decisions on. And I like to think that when we get people in this profession, whether it's medical or custody, civilian side is um, ultimately the civilian side and custody, you're going to have to have the ability to adapt and adjust. So I would like to think that when you come into this profession or you come into this profession of being that first responder, you should have that in you. You know, you should have that in you. If any, any time you lose it along the way, then that's more on the agency and not on the individual. You can have a lot of people that want to come in and they're go-getters and they do what they got to do, but how you approach them is what's going to stop them. You know, you can cultivate it or you can go ahead and, you know, be that person who micromanages and makes them hesitant. Now, for me, I would tell my new boots, I would make sure I partner with them with somebody that wants to train. They want that interaction. They love what they do. And then you get that perfect dance, the want to train with the want to learn. And we talked about that. You want them to deserve, you want them to get the best and worst so they can develop, um, you know, what works, what doesn't work and start kind of passively taking the knowledge in. Yes, there is some effort on their end to read policies and procedures and I'll get to that, but there's a lot of stuff that they're going to collect passively without them really knowing because it's the daily routine of, of life, the daily routine of dealing with the inmate population and just kind of, you know, and, and the structure of the facility, the layout of the facility. So there are things that they'll pick up passively. And again, we discussed this, I believe, in the other uh, on the line, is they don't, may not realize how much they've learned until they move in their career a few years. They look back and like, man, I can't believe I didn't know all this and just how much you step, you know, gradually because it's slow and subtle. But here's my first piece of advice that I would give in developing discretion. It's not, a just, it's not just about reading policy and procedure, but it's about understanding it. That, that's, that's the key. You know, I could give you something and you could read it and oh, I'm good. No, no. Do you understand it? So for me, I know that you're going to face a lot of novel situations, but if you understand the end result, if you understand what the agency wants from you, what your role is, what the resolution needs to be, you'll start developing discretion because you know what the end game is. Now I scramble and I have 18 years in. Connie, I'm sure you scrambled and you have many years in of experience. The scramble is going to happen. You only get lost if you don't know where you need to go, where you need to be. So technically, what, what I'm trying to get at is that if you, have the end, if you have the end in mind, if you know that, okay, at this point I need to be here, then when things go outside of policy, at least you can employ some discretion as to how to bring things back to policy. So first piece of advice, no policy understand policy, know the end result. So just in case you're ever caught in a situation where it's not defined by policy, take a second and say, well, where do I need to be at the end of this? What's the end game? 
And then that will be your effort. And then when you get challenged, if anybody goes to say, well, why'd you do it this way? Your point is very valid. You start from where policy and procedure fail because again, you know, not every policy and procedure is perfect. We know that. But in an effort to bring things back, because that shows knowledge of policy and procedure, because now you're pushing it on the agency, which is great. It has to be. we got to evolve. Uh, now you're able to say, well, this is what I had to do to bring things back. And I promise you, knowing that end game, you'll start to develop a lot of discretion. What's your thoughts on that, Connie? So I absolutely agree with the focus on policy and procedure. I think that it really matters that you actually, even if in your study of the policy, you have to take the moment to interpret that policy and really digest it. And if you find that your interpretation might be a little off based on what you saw somebody else do, like it's okay to ask the question why. It's because sometimes as the new person, you're bringing people back to policy right? Because there are all these informal practices that happen in facilities at, that are, are routine. And so many times as the new person who's actually in the thick of policy, you can go and ask the question, so why do we do things like this? The policy said we should do X, Y, or Z. And that might not be the popular thing to do. People may not embrace you <laughs> because it, they don't necessarily want you to come and try to change things, but it's not you changing things just know that it's okay to ask the questions as you're in the thick of policies and you're talking to people who've been far removed from what the current pro the current policy is sometimes just asking the question helps us regroup and refocus as a unit like oh you know what we did pick up doing this does anyone know the history behind why we do things this this way now because those are the questions we need to ask ourselves how did we get away from policy and so are we really putting all of, our, all of us at risk? I think the other thing to, for me is really aligning on the mission. So if the mission is safety and security, from a, even from a civilian perspective, even though we're thinking about here are all the things that are within the scope of me being a nurse or me being a social worker or me being the administrator, what is the DOC at mission? Like how do we make sure that we're aligning with whatever that mission is. So if I'm in the field doing whatever it is that I do, but meanwhile, I'm doing things that also compromise safety and security, I have to realize that I'm not in alignment with, with what the mission is. So when you say, where do you want to end up at? You know, I think knowing what those missions are, knowing what the intentions are, knowing where the agency is trying to go, I think really matters as a new person who comes in. That way, it kind of puts focus on all of those policies. Oh, so this is how this applies to us getting to safety and security. Oh, so this is how this applies to whatever. And I think the moment we can kind of align sort of the policy w w with what we know to be the end game, I think that will help you quite a bit getting into um, developing that discretion. Yeah, and it kind of is like the difference between checkers and chess. You know, checkers is totally a reactionary game, move for move, where chess is strategy. You're thinking ahead, thinking six steps. And I, I think sometimes as you, for those that develop experience, they may not even realize that they're employing chess. You know, I mean, I would tell people, let me ask you a question. When you go back and you look yourself at the beginning, you know, I'm sure a lot of things you did were immediate reaction. And then eventually you moved yourself above two steps, three steps, four steps. So now you're in your career and you're thinking six steps ahead. I mean, as administration, I would like to think that we're always playing chess. You know, and sometimes to the point where we have to spell it out to the front line, like, I know you want to do this, but hold off because we've done this before. Let me go six, but I'm still going to go back and explain to them why I'm over here. Even though that may... They may not even get to that point. The point is you have to prepare for that. And a lot of that for me now kind of runs on automatic because, again, I gained that experience through my position, but I didn't have that at first. So the first couple of weeks I just sat and watched everybody, like the advice I just gave, and then eventually I, I, I saw what was the needs of each department. I saw what they expected. I saw the end results. And then I started realizing, okay, well, I may not know specifically what this concern is, but I do know that you need to accomplish this, correct? Yes. So because you need to accomplish this, then the only way I can see that getting done from this point is this way. And believe it or not, I become like this problem solver, all because I know where they need to be, which means that as long as I stand firm to where they need to be, 
that gives me a foundation to maneuver in my argument. Now, when it also comes to uh, discretion for those that are, again, we're talking about people that are new, but you don't, you're not given the perfect environment to employ discretion, which means that you may not have people to ask because that happens a lot lately. We're understaffed. A lot of new people are coming in. We're losing people with experience. You know, then you have to really, th this, is, this is where I, I wish we were in a perfect world, but this is really when you have to be insightful. You really have to really be insightful about yourself. That's one thing. And second thing is really take a second, if possible, to think about what the situation is, ha what, what's happening in front of you, if the situation allows you to have that. Some situations don't. Some situations require that automatic response. But I'm going to tell you something. If time and pressure pushes you into an automatic response, and this is why I love what Connie said, where you have to act immediately and there's really not that time to think of it, think of it all through, uh, well, that's where, where did it come from? Is it coming from a positive space? So uh, Connie, in, the, in medical, I'm sure that there are a lot of things where you just have to act immediately and you just have to make a good judgment call. And that's where, again, in this position, in, in the profession that we do, you have to have that ability coming in. I can't stress that enough. I, I can't walk you through making a decision. I can't do that. You've already come in, hopefully, with the gift of adapting and adjusting. And if you can't, you know, the one thing what I'm going to do is first, I'm going to look at the environment to see if they're stopping you from doing that. And that comes from micromanaging, bad supervisors. We talked about that. But if you have people that cultivate growth that are not quick to pass judgment, but be constructive, look at the fact of where the decision was made. Was it a positive space? And you're still not able to make that decision. This is not a profession for you. Would you agree? I would. I mean, I think that, you know, when you come in, I mean, I think, and I, honestly, I really believe that it applies to anybody, right? When you come in, especially so say you're a nurse, right? And you get assigned to the medical unit. When you come in, the first thing that you should be doing is getting to know your patients, right? That way, if in fact something does pop off, you're already familiar with what's in your, what's in your unit. What's in my unit? I got these 12 patients. Here are all the things that I probably need to know because here are the things that could be happening. This could happen with a diabetic patient. This could happen with a patient who's sundowning. This could happen with a patient who has an amputation. And it's almost like preparing yourself for what are the possible outcomes that could happen during my day. It may not happen, but you own that. And I think when we start to own that this is the environment we work in, there's a lot of uncertainty in the environment. We know the environment could be volatile, but how do we come in prepared to respond? Because we may not have the moment to be able to think about it, but if you're already thinking about it, you can kind of formulate some of the strategies. If this was to go down, this is what I would do in this situation. And hopefully you don't have to realize that in your shift. But if it does, at least you've had some forethought of mine to say, here are the 12 people I have in my unit. Here's all the medical issues that I know that they're facing. Here are all the things that I think could be happening based on the chart review, based on the medication they were given, based on the fact that they didn't eat this morning, based on the fact that you know they, were, they had to go to court this morning. Whatever those things are that are happening in the environment, I think that we have to be intentional about preparing for those so that we aren't so blindsided. And those are the things that I think help us to build that discretion. They help us to learn more about how we would respond in different situations. Right. Russ actually would, would, say, would agree with you 100% because he has taught us about muscle memory. Just as much as people train to, for martial arts or train to get that weapon out, you know, you should be training your mind and running through those what-if situations, what-if situations. So, you know, it becomes automatic. And next thing you know, you don't have to talk yourself through it. You just automatically, your body's reacting to what's in front of you. Uh, but for those who still get nervous, you know, I, you really have to ask yourself, is this a position for you? I mean, at some point, if I'm a supervisor, I want a decision being made. That's the key. And then we'll go over, you know, what was right or wrong about the decision. But the point is, I'm going to give you credit for making a decision. But I'm also going to be very careful about my approach on how we correct that decision. It has to be a learning where I can motivate you to make more decisions. And I also think just in this dialogue here, adapt and adjust actually run parallel with the definition of discretion. I just want people to know that because to me, employing discretion comes with that ability to adapt and adjust because you can't always look at policy. You become too predictable, but there could be 
how you respond. I think that's what it is. Inmates know you have to respond, but it's how you respond, correct? Yeah, I think the big challenge for us, though, is that, you know, in corporate world, we talk about like a learning environment. How do we create a learning environment? And in this space, a learning environment could be detrimental, right? So as much as we want to cultivate the learning and we want to be supportive of employees as they make decisions, they also have to have at least some foundation of what the true expectations are based on what the policies tell us to do. And then we can build on that learning. I think when we kind of, and so I think it's on us, I think, or as on administration to really look at, are we cultivating an environment where people can learn? Or are we continuing to cultivate this environment where we blame? And when we blame, we still put people in this space where they're paralyzed by the fear of getting in trouble. I can't make a decision because I'm not going to be supported. And when I'm not supported, I don't like what that feels like. I don't like being chewed out, right? I don't like thinking that maybe my job is on the line because I made a poor decision. So I think it's understanding that if we want people to be able to learn and we're going to support that learning in the role, we have to shift from this blaming environment to one that says, okay, yeah, you might have messed up. But like, let's let's figure out how you could have made a better decision. Let's do a debriefing. Let's do something that's constructive. As and, and there might be some consequences, right? This is not to say there will be no negative consequence for a crappy outcome, right? It just might be. But at least we can do is support that learning process because when you mess up, you learn. You will probably never do that again. And I think that's what we have to realize that the mess ups are when people do learn. You know, because when they're doing nothing and they're just off on the sideline, there's no learning happening. They're watching everybody else learn. You got to be in the game, you know. I like what you're saying because you're talking about being constructive, which is the learning process. But definitely whatever you do, don't minimize an initiative that comes from a positive space. I also want to add something else before we go to closing. Something as you were talking, you just came to my mind. Um, a lot of people that move up, they could just move up based on tests, which doesn't mean that they're able to do the job. It just means that they tested well. So again, if you have an employee that has the want to do something good, has the want to make a decision, and then you get supervisors that wind up, instead of being constructive with them, they wind up destroying their ability to make a decision. Now these could be potentially be future leaders who have no want to make a decision, which ultimately will now will affect the front line. But it did start with that supervisor taking the initiative from that individual. Connie, do you have anything you want to say in closing? I would just like to say, you know, not everyone based on, you know, time means that they're going to be a good leader, right? And so just because you've been on the job for tons of time or, you know, so I had the experience of having two doctors. They were, one was supposed to end up being like the, um, super, like the, the supervising physician in the facility, and it turned out that the one who had been there for 18 years was not a people person at all. And the one who was there for just three years, she rocked. And so I think the more that we start to work with people based on what they're capable of, as opposed to the time that they've been on the job and we should be assuming that they're gonna do well, is it's better for us to really, um, I want to say, take the time with folks to really develop the goodness that we see in them, despite the mistakes they might make along the way, because we've all made mistakes along the way of our journey. I agree that right now we can foster the environment for individuals to utilize discretion right at the very beginning. So part of it's definitely on the supervisor, but part of it is also on the individual who's being put in these situations. They need to know that, hey, you got to be able to adapt and adjust, you know, and sometimes that's just literally looking into yourself, knowing, can I do this? Because in the end, you can't always look for people to give you the answer. You can look for information. I'm not saying that. You can always look for information so you can make informed decisions. But sometimes you're not going to be given that. And sometimes it's going to be required for you to act. And you'll have to deal with the consequences later. But as long as you're able to express why. As long as you understand where you need it to be and be able to express where maybe policy failed. Again, the, the big thing is knowing that policy and procedure. So if you ever have to maneuver away from it, your starting argument will be where policy failed. 
And it's very hard for management to go against that because now you're pushing it on management. But if you don't know and you're just making decisions uninformed and not being able to defend that decision by where policy failed, that's where the consequences could be severe. And then technically it could come up as being negligent or not coming from that positive space. But very good dialogue. As always, guys, the show is here. If you have it, please subscribe. Oh, don't forget, we also have the Tear Talk podcast. Please check it out. It's available through Law Enforcement Today, through Spotify. Me and Russ Hamilton co-host. We're actually going to have Connie on this week, and we're going to be discussing working with medical staff. Show's doing very well. We appreciate the downloads and the support. And again, guys, the show Tear Talk is always for you guys. You brave men and women that work in corrections. So please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stay safe. Oh!